Amen. Our sermon text for the second service will be 1 Peter uh, chapter 1. We'll read verses 3 to 9. So 1 Peter chapter 1, beginning in verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to His great mercy, He has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you, do, though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him, and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Let's pray. Eternal Father, who has spoken in various times and in various ways to your people in the past, but in these last days, in your Son, the incarnate Word, we pray that you would open the mouth of your servant to proclaim that Word in the power of the Holy Spirit, of the Spirit. And we pray that the same Spirit will open the hearts of its hearers here assembled to receive your holy gospel and write on their hearts your holy law, even as you have promised. All this gracious Father, we ask in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, if uh, you were to write a letter, if we were as, as a church were to draft a letter to our brothers and sisters in, let's say, Florida, um, what kind of a metaphor uh, would you use that th they would understand? You might think of uh, maybe alligators or something like that. If we were to write to our brothers and sisters at Phoenix URC, we might use a desert metaphor. And if we were to write to our brothers and sisters at Anchorage URC, maybe we'd use a uh, uh, a polar bear metaphor. Uh, we could use a fishing metaphor. There's lots of fishing metaphors in the Bible. Um, if, if they were to write to us, if they were to write to Christians in California, what kind of a metaphor might they use? Well, this is the golden state, so maybe they would use a gold metaphor. So I want to talk a little bit about gold. Gold was discovered in the 25th century BC. It was found in mines in Egypt. Uh, but it wasn't until the 9th century B.C., so 16 centuries later, that it was found at the surface level for the very first time. It was discovered in Asia Minor. And so there was something like a gold rush that happened in Asia Minor. And the next century, um, the king Croesus was the first one to mint a golden coin. And so gold was used as currency for the very first time there in Asia Minor. And gold, aside from being something that's beautiful is also a dense and durable metal. It's, been, it's uh, a metal that can be refined through fire. Its melting point is 1,948 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, it's also a, a metal that's very malleable, which makes it ideal for lots of different purposes. And so this is a metal that is very valuable and very precious. And in Asia Minor, gold came to symbolize both immortality and power. It was viewed as the epitome of something that is permanent and enduring. And so Peter, the Apostle of Jesus Christ, as he writes to these Christians in Asia Minor, what kind of a metaphor does he use? He uses a gold metaphor as he writes to them. And so this is a metaphor that we as Californians can understand. Uh, his goal as he writes to these Christians is to give them hope in the midst of persecution. And that hope comes through faith in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And amazingly, Peter tells these Christians that their faith is more durable than gold. This gold that symbolizes immortality to them. It's refined by fire, but that gold will eventually perish, like all things of this creation. Uh, Peter says that in his second epistle. Uh, 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 10-12 to 12, describes how this entire created order will be consumed in fire, and everything in it will perish. And so even gold, the most durable and precious metal, like all other things in this world, will eventually perish. However there, there, however, there is no expiration date on the faith of God's elect people. 
So after this present world has been consumed by fire, 1 Peter tells us that the faith of God's people, strengthened through various trials, will still be found on the last day, resulting in praise, glory, and honor. Well, where can such faith come from? It's probably hard to believe that such durability, more durable than gold, can be attributed to your faith. Uh, perhaps such a claim could only come from someone who had never experienced any sort of doubts or fears, someone who had a perfectly strong faith. Well, no, actually, this promise in Scripture was written by Peter. Peter, the one to whom when he tried to walk on water, Jesus said to him, O oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? Uh, Peter's also the one who denied Jesus three times in the face of persecution because he was scared. So Peter's not exactly the paragon for this perfect, strong faith that never experiences any doubts. And yet he has this confidence that the faith of Christians is stronger and is more durable than gold. It's because Peter knows the one who creates and confirms and preserves that faith in our hearts. And that's why he can boldly claim that the faith of God's elect is more durable than gold. And it's faith that gives hope to Christians during our exile. So just as gold was a precious commodity in Asia Minor, so too was hope. Uh, hope was something that people wanted. Karen Jobes says this in her commentary on 1 Peter. She says, the, uh, the, uh, the epidemic of hopelessness in our times is not just a modern phenomenon. This hopelessness echoes in Sophocles' reflection on the fate of Oedipus. That is best not to be born at all, and the second best is to die at birth. So in, in the Greek world, despite all this wealth, there's still hopelessness and despair that abounds all around. Peter knew that Christians were not exempt from experiencing such difficulties. In some ways, the Christians in Asia Minor were actually, uh, maybe had even more reason to struggle with hope. Uh, these Gentiles in Asia Minor that had been converted to Christianity, they were new Christians, and they found themselves being ostracized and alienated from society. Maybe there wasn't a formal persecution, but there was this informal kind of persecution that they were experiencing. Their Christian convictions didn't allow them to participate in many of the cultural activities that were around them. Their insistence on worshiping only the one true God meant that they had to abstain from many of the practices of their pagan culture. And this refusal to participate in these other practices brought scorn on them from their neighbors. And so these new Christians surely faced the temptation to compromise their Christian convictions and return to their old ways of living. What hope was there for them? Could their faith really withstand these trials? Well, the similarities are striking between our first century brothers and sisters in Asia Minor and what we experience as 21st century Christians in the United States. We too live in a remarkably prosperous time. And yet, there goes that page. <laughs> and yet, we're in, living in a time that is characterized by hopelessness, depression, and anxiety all around us. And if you've checked the news this morning, you'll know that there's going to be a lot more of that in the days to come. But Christians aren't immune to these things. While we don't experience the kind of severe persecution that other brothers and sisters in Christ experience in other parts of the world, uh, we do know the sting of being ostracized and alienated by our neighbors. As Christians who follow the Bible, uh, our views on human sexuality are considered outdated, bigoted, and not welcome in polite society. Uh, for the young ones among us here today, our belief that things like drunkenness and recreational use of drugs, that those things are sinful, means that a lot of the time you're not going to be invited to parties or get-togethers that your unbelieving neighbors participate in. And while practices like cohabitation or celebrating Pride Month are the norm for society around us, as Christians we believe that we cannot and should not participate in such things. And so our abstaining from these cultural activities can also bring upon us the kind of scorn from our neighbors that the Christians in Asia Minor were experiencing. And so we too know what that temptation is like to compromise on our Christian convictions just so that we can get along with those around us. And so we can avoid that kind of societal alienation. And so like the Christians in Asia Minor, we too here today, we need hope. So Peter's message to these Gentile Christians in Asia Minor is particularly 
relevant for us here today. And so as we look at 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 to 9, we want to see where our hope comes from. We want to see how it can survive these kinds of tests and trials. And we want to see what the final outcome will be as we seek to grow in our faith and our Savior, Jesus Christ. So as we think about uh, this hope that is driven by faith, a faith that is more durable than gold, even though gold is refined in a furnace, there's one thing that should be obvious to us. Such faith cannot be created by our own strength. We cannot work up this faith in our hearts by our own free will. Uh, one way to think about this is that in First Peter, uh, in Second Peter actually, Peter says that all of creation will be destroyed. It will all be consumed by fire. So creation will go away. And so a faith that can survive that, a faith that will still be found on the last day, as verse 7 says in our text today, a faith that hopes in an imperishable inheritance. That kind of a faith must have its origin from outside of creation. That is, the Creator, God. And that's precisely what Peter tells us in verses 3 to 4, which say, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to His great mercy, He has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you. God has caused us to be born again. Uh, Peter also talks about that in verse 2 when he mentions the sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit and the sanctification of the Holy Spirit. It's the Spirit of God who causes us to be born again. And so when Peter, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, speaks about being born again, he's uh, referencing the teaching of our Lord Jesus Christ in John chapter 3. There Jesus says in verse 3, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And then again in verse 5, he says, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. So it's the Holy Spirit who gives us the gift of faith. He re regenerates all of God's elect, as Peter calls the Christians in verse 1, causing them to be born again. So faith is not the product of our own effort, but it's owed to the work of the Holy Spirit, who changes our heart from a heart of stone into a heart of flesh, with the result that we will believe. So faith is a gift from God. Uh, we see that clearly, for example, in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing, it is a gift of God. That's why the Bible speaks of faith in such lofty terms in 1 Peter. It's not that we've produced in our hearts this kind of really impressive faith, that we've done something so great. No, the Spirit of God, the one by whom the earth was created, the one by whom the prophets spoke, and the one by whom Jesus was raised from the dead, he is the one who creates faith in our hearts and dwells in us. And because of that, we can be confident that this faith is, in fact, more durable than gold. And the Holy Spirit creates this faith in our hearts by causing us to be born again. Uh, 1 Peter 1.3 says that this is done according to the, uh, the great mercy of God the Father. And it's also through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Um, and so... Peter is putting our salvation in Trinitarian terms. He does that in verse 2 when he talks about the foreknowledge of God the Father, the sanctification of the Holy Spirit, and the sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. And again here, in verse 3, he keeps going with this theme of salvation being the result of our triune God. Salvation is according to the merciful plan of the Father. It is accomplished by the resurrection of the Son, Jesus Christ. And it is applied by the Holy Spirit, the one who causes us to be born again. So our salvation is the result of our Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And He will not fail to accomplish His sovereign purposes. So the byproduct of this Trinitarian work is described for us in verse 4. It says that there is an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading. The metaphor of an inheritance is fitting here. When you talk about being born again, uh, when a child is born, the firstborn, he receives the inheritance. And when you are born again, there is also a corresponding inheritance. And it's, a her it's an inheritance that's given. An inheritance isn't something that you earn. It's a free gift. Uh, just as being born isn't something that the child achieves, being reborn isn't something we achieve. And so the inheritance that is given 
from rebirth is not one that is earned. It is a gift of grace. Now these three words used to describe the inheritance, in Greek they all begin with the same letter, alpha. Uh, Peter uses some alliteration here. And so if we, if we wanted to preserve that alliteration in English, we could say it's, it's an inheritance that is undying, undefiled, and unfading. Or we could go with imperishable, impeccable, and infinite. The point here is that all three of these words have very similar meanings. And Peter uses three different terms to really drive home his point that this inheritance is an eternal one. Gold and all the things of this world that the people of Asia Minor loved and desired, those things will perish. But the Christian's inheritance will never perish. We are born again to a living hope and an inheritance that is imperishable. Jesus himself taught this, uh, the value of uh, the imp imperishable inheritance, not the things of this world. Uh, he says in his Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 6, 19, he says, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasure in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And Peter's very clear as he talks to us that this treasure, these heavenly treasures uh, that we hope in, this kind of hope is not merely an optimistic outlook on the future. It's a hope that is rooted in God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. He is the one who keeps our inheritance in heaven. And so he will not fail to give his people what he has promised. Christ has earned for us the eternal blessedness, such as no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no heart has imagined. And he's done this through his death, burial, and resurrection. And that inheritance is being kept for us by our triune God, who will give us this eternal blessing on the last day. Uh, God not only keeps this inheritance for us in heaven until the last day, but he is also preserving and guarding you today. Since it is true that the kind of faith that 1 Peter talks about isn't the kind of faith that we can work up by our own strength, it must come from God, then how much more so is it true that this faith cannot be preserved by our own strength, but must be preserved by God? For our hope to be a sure hope, uh, God must be the one who guarantees the final result. For our faith to be more durable than gold, God must be the one who preserves and strengthens us in our faith. God's word promises to all you here today who have trusted in Jesus Christ for your salvation that since God is the one who has created that faith in your hearts, he will also guard you in that faith. Verse 5 says, You by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. That's part of human nature for us to look to strong and powerful things for security and for safety in this life. Well, what power is more powerful than God's power? God's power, the one by which we are being guarded for, uh, through faith for salvation. And so this promise really is good news for us here today. The same God by whom our hearts were reborn unto a living hope with true faith will also preserve us in that faith forever until the day of the appearing of Christ Jesus when he will come to take us to himself into the joy and glory of heaven. And so this gives us tremendous reason to rejoice. And that's exactly what verse 6 goes on to say we should do. This is what verses 6 and 7 say. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And there's this tension here that Peter acknowledges. Currently in this age, Christians are grieved by various trials and temptations. But then in the last time, Jesus Christ will be revealed. However, Peter doesn't say that we grieve now and we will rejoice later. Instead, he says that we rejoice in the present tense. We are presently rejoicing. Yes, we grieve now, but we also rejoice currently in this age. Uh, we're not waiting until the last day re to rejoice. Heidelberg Catechism summarizes this well in answer 58, which says, Even as I now already in my heart 
experience the beginning of eternal joy. So after this life, I will experience a perfect blessedness. So yes, we grieve in various trials in the present, but we do not grieve as those without hope. We hope in an inheritance that is kept for us in heaven, that leads us to rejoice even now amid our trials. So as temptation grows from the culture around us, tempting us to compromise and even abandon our Christian faith, we can look to the future with hope. By God's power, we are being guarded in the faith. We're not fighting this battle against temptation on our own. And we fight against temptation with a sure hope that we will receive an eternal inheritance secured for us by our triune God. Through these trials, our... our did I skip the page? No, okay, we're good. Through these trials, our faith is being strengthened. Uh, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 7 mentions the proven genuineness of your faith. What he means is that just as fire tests and refines gold, various trials in this life will also refine our faith. He doesn't mean here to say that God is testing our faith. James 1.13 rules out that possibility when it says, Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. So God's not setting up some sort of an obstacle course for us to pass through in this life to see, is your faith really genuine? Uh, God is the one who gives us the gift of faith. So he knows that his elect have genuine faith. However, 1 Peter chapter 1 does teach us that all of those who are given the gift of faith will be preserved in that faith. So the trials and temptations that we experience in this life aren't to prove our faith to God, but it can serve to prove our faith to ourselves and to those who are around us. It is God who causes us to persevere. And the result is that when Christ returns, all of God's elect will be found with faith in him for praise, glory, and honor for all believers. Again, Peter uses here three terms in a row that have similar meaning, uh, praise, glory, and honor. Uh, He doesn't use alliteration this time like he did in the other one, Uh, but this trio of words serves to reinforce what he is saying. On the last day when Jesus Christ returns to judge the living and the dead, that day will be a glorious day for all of those who are found united to our Savior Jesus Christ by true faith. So therefore, look to your faithful Savior Jesus Christ as the sole source of the hope that you need in this life and in the life to come. As you go through trials in this life, keep your gaze fixed on Christ. Ask him to give you his Holy Spirit to strengthen your faith when it feels weak. And he will fill you with the hope that you need to endure the troubles that you face now for a little while. There's more encouragement for us in this passage today. Uh, As you make your way as an exile in this fallen and sinful world, uh, unlike Peter, who got to spend three years walking with Jesus Christ, And then after Christ's resurrection, he got to spend 40 more days with Jesus being prepared for apostolic ministry. Uh, We here today uh, live in the time between Christ's first and second coming, which means we don't get to see Christ physically. And apparently the same was true for those that Peter is writing to. But Peter doesn't want that to deter us from rejoicing in Christ. Verse 8 says, Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory. And so 1 Peter chapter 1 uh, serves to teach us uh, to have hope in Jesus Christ, even though we do not see him. John 20, 29, Jesus says to Thomas, Have you believed because you have seen? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. So the message of the gospel was always intended to go beyond just that group of eyewitnesses. God planned from eternity past that the gospel would be spread to the nations. And so these Gentile Christians in Asia Minor are actually the fulfillment of that promise. Peter wants to give hope even to those Christians who aren't among that list of eyewitnesses that Peter or Paul lists for us in 1 Corinthians 15. And as Peter tells them, that they love Christ, and that they believe in him, he's also encouraging us as Christians to do the same. 
Uh, while in his human nature, Christ is not now on earth, in his divinity, majesty, grace, and spirit, he is never absent from us. We're not left to figure out these things on our own. Christ is still with us, and he's particularly with us through his word and sacrament. And so that's why verse 8 says that we can rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory. This is the second time in this short passage that uh, it talks about rejoicing. Uh, It's a fruit of what God has done for us, that we respond by rejoicing in gratitude. So as we consider what God has done for us, we are to rejoice. We're to praise Him. And this takes us back to the very opening words of the passage that we're looking at today. It says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. God has given us a living hope. And so we respond to what God has done for us by rejoicing in His salvation, praising Him for His marvelous and powerful saving acts. And the result of the work of God is found for us in verse 9, which says, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. The faith that comes from God is more durable than gold and is more valuable too, because it results in salvation. However, this is not due to how strongly we believe. It is not the strength of your faith, but rather the object of your faith, Jesus Christ. In other words, believing strongly in the wrong object is of no value whatsoever. But faith that rests in Jesus Christ, even if it's a weak faith, is more valuable than gold. Uh, even Even when our faith is weak, if you trust in Jesus Christ alone, he is a sure foundation for your hope. Faith in Jesus is promised to obtain the outcome of the salvation of your souls, That is the imperishable, undefiled, and unfading inheritance that God has promised to all his chosen people. Our our all-powerful God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, is guarding that inheritance so that all those who trust in Christ, though we do not see him, we will be saved. So rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory. Let the good news of the gospel fill your lips with joy and with praise to our almighty God. This passage in 1 Peter is a doxology, and it's directed to the one and only God who is worthy of our praise. We praise God because of what he has done and what he is doing for us. God has saved us through the resurrection of Jesus Christ and according to the mercy of the Father, uh, the, the regenerating work of the Holy Spirit, and the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ, we are being saved. We've been given a faith, a hope, an inheritance that is more valuable than gold. And the result is that we have a sure hope in which we rejoice even though we suffer in this world. So as you face various trials and temptations in this life, remember the hope that God has given you. What awaits you is an eternal inheritance that far outstrips all the sufferings that we will face for a little while longer. An inheritance that is imperishable reserved for us in heaven. Amen. Let's pray. Almighty God, graciously grant that your word, which we have heard, may be inscribed inwardly on our hearts. As we receive your word meekly with pure affection, may our hearts be filled with love and reverence for you. Cause us to bear the fruit of the Spirit and to live in holiness, diligently following your commandments. And may it please you to use us to lead those who are lost, wandering, and confused into the way of truth. All this we pray for the honor and praise of your name through Jesus Christ our Lord and the power and fellowship of the Holy Spirit. Amen.